For ages, man in the West has believed that Rome and Greece had provided him with civilization. On the other hand, Greek philosophers have declared on multiple occasions that they drew on even earlier sources. Travelers returning to Europe from Egypt described seeing imposing pyramids, temple cities half buried in sand dunes guarded by bizarre stone monsters. Thus it was that when Napoleon landed in Egypt in 1799, he brought a team of experts with him to study and interpret the monuments. One of his officers discovered a stone slab near Rosetta with an inscription dating from 196 BCE, written in hieroglyphic, old Egyptian pictographic writing, and two additional scripts. The discovery of ancient Egyptian script and language, as well as later archaeological investigation, demonstrated to Western man that Egypt had a sophisticated civilization long before Greek culture arrived. Egyptian archives date royal dynasties back to 3100 BCE, more than two millennia before the Hellenic civilization. Greece was a latecomer rather than a pioneer, maturing in the 5th and 4th centuries BC. So was Egypt the cradle of our civilization? Regardless of how logical that conclusion sounded, the facts worked against it, despite the fact that Greek scholars documented visits to Egypt the ancient knowledge sources they mentioned were unearthed elsewhere. The pre-Hellenic cultures of the Aegean Sea, the Minoan on Crete's island and the Mycenaean on the Greek mainland, showed traces of Near Eastern culture adoption rather than Egyptian culture adoption. Key routes for the Greeks to get access to the earlier civilization were Syria and Anatolia, not Egypt. Scholars have been ecstatic to discover a rising number of parallels between Semitic and Hellenic civilizations, noting that the Dorian conquest of Greece and the Israelite invasion of Canaan following Exodus from Egypt both took place about the same period, around the 13th century BCE. By establishing that Linear A, an early Minoan script, reflected a Semitic language, Professor Cyrus H. Gordon pioneered a new field of research. He believed that the pattern, as opposed to the content, of Hebrew and Minoan civilizations is startlingly comparable. And the island's name's Crete was the same as the Hebrew word Keret, the walled city, and had a Semitic counterpart in the story about a king of Keret. The Near East gave birth the Hellenistic alphabet, which gave rise to Latin and English alphabets. According to ancient Greek historians, the alphabet was given to them by a Phoenician named Cadmus, which means old, who had the same number of letters in the same order as in the Hebrew alphabet. It was the only Greek alphabet during the time of the Trojan War. The poet Simonides of Xeos raised a number of letters to the 26th that we know sometime in the 5th century BCE. When comparing the sequence, names, signs, and even numerical values of the original Near Eastern alphabet with those of the far later ancient Greek and more modern Latin, it is apparent that Greek and Latin writing, as well as the entire foundation of our Western culture, came from the Near East. Greek ties to the Near East in the first millennia BCE are well known to scholars culminating in Alexander the Macedonian's conquest of the Persians in 331 BCE. Many details concerning these Persians and their homelands, roughly paralleling today's Iran, were recorded in Greek records. Scholars concluded they were part of the Aryan or lordly people who appeared from somewhere near the Caspian Sea toward the end of the second millennium BCE, based mostly on the names of their kings, Cyrus, Darius, Xerxes, and the names of their deities, which appear to belong in the Indo-European linguistic stem. It's also reached westward to Asia Minor, eastward to India, and southerly to the countries of the Medes and Parsis, mentioned in the Old Testament. If you're interested in information on the ancient Aryan race, please check out our series on Arctic Home in the Vedas, which we have linked in the description. 
wasn't all that simple. Despite their alleged foreign origins, the invaders were treated as if they were actual figures in the Old Testament. Cyrus, for example, was referred to as anointed of Yahweh, indicating a remarkable link between non-Hebrew and the Hebrew God. According to the ancient book of Ezra, Cyrus confessed his attention to restore the temple in Jerusalem and stated that it was acting on directions from Yahweh, whom he referred to as God of Heaven. After the name given to the dynasty by its founder, Hakamanish, Cyrus and the successive monarchs of his dynasty were known as Achaemenids. This is not an Aryan title, but a magnificent Semitic appellation, meaning wise man. Scholars have mainly dismissed various signs pointing to parallels between the Hebrew god Yahweh and the god Achaemenians dubbed the wise lord, who was shown on Darius' royal seal as soaring in the skies within a winged globe. The old Persians' cultural, spiritual, and historical roots have already been established, stretching back to the ancient empires of Babylon and Assyria, whose size and fall were recorded in the Old Testament. The symbols that made up the script, found on Achaemenid monuments and seals, were originally regarded to be lovely ornaments. Engelbert Kampfer, who visited Persepolis, the old Persian capital in 1686, identified the marks as cunates or wedge-shaped impressions. That script has now been referred to as cuneiform. As the Achaemenid inscriptions were deciphered, it became evident that they were inscribed in the same script as the inscriptions found on ancient artifacts and tablets in Mesopotamia, the plains and highlands between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. In 1843, Paul and Emil Bota, intrigued by the dispersed artifacts, set out to conduct the first significant deliberate excavation. He chose a location near Mosul, presently known as Khorasbad in northern Mesopotamia. Bota was able to determine the site was named dur Sharukin in cuneiform writings. The name meant walled city of the righteous king, according to Semitic inscriptions, which were written in the sister language to Hebrew. This ruler is referred to as Sargon II in our textbooks. This Assyrian king's capital had a magnificent royal palace with walls lined in sculptured bas-reliefs that would run for nearly a mile it laid end to end. The city and the royal compound were guarded by a ziggurat, a step pyramid that served as a stairway to heaven for the gods. The city's layout and sculptures reflected a grandiose way of life. In just five years, the palaces, temples, residence, stables, warehouses, walls, gates, columns, decorations, statues, artworks, towers, ramparts, terraces, and gardens were all built. The mind reels before the potential strength of the empire that could do so much in such a short space 3,000 years ago, writes George Continue in his book, Babylon and Assyria. Not to be outdone by the French, the English arrived in the form of Sir Austin Henry Laird, who chose a location 10 miles downstream from Khorasbad on the Tigris River. Kanujik was the local name and it turned out to be the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. Biblical names and events were beginning to take shape under Assyria's last three major rulers, Sennacherib, Sheridan, and Ashurbanipal, Nineveh was the royal capital. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the walled cities of Judah relates the Old Testament in 2 Kings 18.13. When the angel of the Lord smote his army, Sennacherib departed and went back and dwelt in Nineveh. Sennacherib and Ashurbanipal built palaces, temples, and works of art that rivaled those of Sargon on the mounds where Nineveh was built. The site of Ashardan's palaces cannot be explored since it is currently the site of a Muslim mosque built over the purported burial place of the prophet Jonah who was swallowed by a whale after refusing to deliver Yahweh's word to Nineveh. According to ancient Greek texts, a commander in Alexander's army witnessed the site of pyramids and remains of an old city. 
metropolis that had already been buried by the time of Alexander. It was also discovered by Laird, and it turned out to be Nimrud, Assyria's military capital. Shalmanzer II erected an obelisk there to commemorate his military achievements and voyages. The obelisk, which is now on display in the British Museum, identifies Yehu, son of Omri, king of Israel, as one of the monarchs who were forced to pay tribute. The Mesopotamian inscriptions and biblical passages back each other up once more. A seriologist, as these researchers have come to be known, were astounded by the increased frequency with which archaeological finds corroborated biblical narratives. They looked to the 10th chapter of Genesis. Nimrod was depicted as a builder of all the Mesopotamian kingdoms, as a mighty hunter by Yahweh's grace. And in the beginning of his kingdom, Babel and Erech and Akkad, all in the land of Shinar, out of that land there emanated Ashur, where Nineveh was built, a city of wide streets, and Kala and Rezin, the great city which is between Nineveh and Kala. From 1903 to 1914, teams led by W. Andre excavated the site uncovering the ruins of Ashur, the Assyrian sacred center and first capital. Only Resen, of all the Assyrian cities listed in the Bible, has been discovered thus far. Its name means the horse's bridle, and therefore it could have been the site of Assyria's royal stables. find this fascinating, please hit the like button. If you're not already, go ahead and subscribe. Click the bell so you'll be notified whenever we put out more great videos like this one. Around the same time as Asher was being excavated, crews led by R. Kaldui were finishing up the excavation of Babylon, the biblical Babel, a massive city with palaces, temples, hanging gardens, and the requisite ziggurat. Artifacts and inscriptions soon revealed the history of Mesopotamia's two rival empires, Babylonia and Assyria, one in the south, the other in the north. Rising and collapsing, battling and coexisting, the two created a 1,500-year-long high civilization, both rising about 1900 BCE. The Babylonians finally captured and destroyed Ashur and Nineveh in 614 and 612 BCE, respectively. When Cyrus the Archimedes invade Babylon in 539 BCE, it ended in ignominy, just as the biblical prophets warned. Though they were adversaries throughout their history, it would be difficult to establish any substantial cultural or material contrast between Assyria and Babylonia. Despite the fact that Assyria's principal deity was Ashur, all-seeing, and Babylonia's was Marduk, son of the pure mound, elsewise the pantheons were nearly identical. Ceremonial gates, winged bowls, bas-reliefs, chariots, tools, utensils, jewelry, statues, and other artifacts made of every conceivable material that have been taken out of the mounds of Assyria and Babylon are among the prize exhibits of many of the world's museums. Thousands upon thousands of inscriptions in the cuneiform script, including cosmologic tales, epic poems, king's histories, temple records, commercial contracts, marriage and divorce records, astronomical tables, astrological forecasts, mathematical formulas, geographic lists, grammar and vocabulary school texts, and not least, texts dealing with the names, genealogies, epithets, deeds, and powers of these kingdoms were the true treasures. Cadian was the common language that linked Assyria and Babylonia, culturally, historically, and religiously. It was the earliest known Semitic language, predating even Hebrew, Aramaic, Phoenician, and Canaanite, but similar to them. However, Neither the Assyrians nor the Babylonians claim to have originated the language or its script. Instead, many of their tablets included a postscript, indicating they were copies of previous originals. So who created the cuneiform script and language with its exact grammar and such extensive vocabulary? 
who was the author of the previous originals, and why was the language known as Akkadian by the Assyrians and Babylonians. The book of Genesis is once again the center of attention. Babel, Erek, and Akkad were the beginnings of his reign. Could there have been such a thing? The remains of Mesopotamia have proven beyond a shadow of doubt that there was once upon a time a kingdom known as Akkad, founded by a much earlier ruler known as a Sharukun, righteous ruler. In his inscriptions, he claimed that his realm spanned from the lower sea, the Persian Gulf, to the upper sea, believed to be the Mediterranean, all thanks to the favor of his deity Enlil. He stated that he made more ships from numerous faraway lands at the dock of Akkad. Scholars were taken aback by the discovery of a Mesopotamian empire in the 3rd millennium BCE. Between the Assyrian Sargon of Dusharakun and the Assyrian Sargon of Akkad, there existed a 2,000 year gap. Yet, long before the rise of Babylonian Assyria, the mounds dug up revealed literature, art, science, politics, commerce, and communications, a full-fledged civilization. Furthermore, it was clearly the forerunner and progenitor of the latter Mesopotamian civilizations. Assyria and Babylonia were simply branches off the Akkadian trunk. However, inscriptions detailing Sargon of Akkad's achievements and pedigree added to the enigma of such an early Mesopotamian civilization. They asserted his full title was King of Akkad, King of Kish, and that he had served as an advisor to the rulers of Kish before ascending to the throne. Was there perhaps an even earlier kingdom, Kish, that existed before Akkad? Experts wondered. The biblical verses received significance once more. And Cush begot Nimrod. He was first to be a hero in the land, and in the beginning of his kingdom, Babel and Erech and Akkad. Many scholars have speculated that Sargon of Akkad was a biblical Nimrod. If one reads Kish for Cush in the biblical verses above, it would seem Nimrod was indeed preceded by Kish, as claimed by Sargon. The scholars then began to accept literally the rest of his inscriptions. He defeated Uruk and tore down its wall. He was victorious in battle with the inhabitants of Ur. He defeated the entire territory from Lagash as far as the sea. Is the biblical Arak the same as Uruk mentioned in Sargon's inscriptions? That was discovered to be the case when the site now known as Varka was uncovered, and the Ur that Sargon was referring to was none other than the biblical Ur. Abraham's Mesopotamian birthplace. The archaeological discoveries not only confirmed the biblical accounts, but they also proved that there must have been kingdoms, cities, and civilizations in Mesopotamia before the third millennia BCE. Only one question remained. How far back could one travel to identify the first civilized kingdom? The key that unlocked that conundrum was yet another language. Names held meaning not only in Hebrew and the Old Testament, but also throughout the ancient Near East, as scholars swiftly discovered. Every person and place name in Akkadian, Babylonian, and Assyrian had a meaning. But the names of the rulers who came before Sargon of Akkad made little sense. Ur Zababa was the name of a king whose court Sargon was counselor. Lugal Zagizi was the name of the king who reigned in Erech, and so on. Sir Henry Rawlinson, speaking to the Royal Asiatic Society in 1853, noted that such names were neither Semitic nor Indo-European, and that they appeared to belong to no known group of languages or peoples. But if the names had meanings, what was the enigmatic language in which they were expressed? Scholars examined the Akkadian inscriptions once more. The Akkadian cuneiform script was essentially syllabic, with each sign representing a whole syllable, ab, ba, but, etc. Despite this, the script used a lot of signs that weren't phonetic syllables, but meant God, city, country, life, exalted, 
or other things. The only explanation for this anomaly was that the signs were remnants of a previous writing system that used pictographs. As a result, Akkadian must have been preceded by a language that was using a writing system similar to Egyptian hieroglyphs. It was clear right away this was about an earlier language, not just an earlier style of writing. Scholars discovered that loan words, words acquired in their whole from another language, were frequently used in Akkadian inscriptions and manuscripts, much the same way a modern Frenchman may borrow the English word weekend. This was especially true when dealing with the scientific or technical terms, as well as subjects involving the gods and the heavens. One of the greatest finds of Akkadian texts was the ruins of a library assembled in Nineveh by Ashurbanipal. Laird and his colleagues carted away from that site 25,000 tablets, many of which were described by the ancient scribes as copies of olden texts. A group of 23 tablets ended with the statement, 23rd tablet, language of Shumer not changed. Another text bore the enigmatic statement by Ashurbanipal himself. The God of scribes has bestowed on me the gift of the knowledge of his art. I have been initiated into the secrets of writing. I can even read the intricate tablets in Shumerian. I understand the enigmatic words in the stone carvings from the days before the flood. The fact that Ashurbanipal claimed to be able to read complicated Shumerian tablets and interpret the words written on them from the days before the flood only added to the mystery. However, in January 1869, Jules Opert proposed to the French Society of Numismatics and Archaeology that the existence of a pre-Akkadian language and people be acknowledged. He suggested that the people be dubbed Sumerians and the area Sumer because the early kings of Mesopotamia had declared their legitimacy by accepting the title King of Sumer and Akkad. Opert was correct, with the exception of mispronouncing the name. It should have been Sumer, not Sumer. Sumer was not a mystery, far away region, but the ancient term for southern Mesopotamia, as the book of Genesis had clearly stated. The land of Shinar included the royal towns of Babylon, Akkad, and Erech. Shinar was Sumer's biblical name. The floodgates were released once the scholars accepted these results. They soon concluded that Tablets with long columns of words were Akkadian Sumerian lexicons and dictionaries constructed in Assyria and Babylonia for their own study of Sumerian, the earliest written language. We would still be a long way from being able to understand Sumerian without these old dictionaries. With their assistance, a tremendous literary and cultural treasure trove became available. It was also discovered that the Sumerian script which was originally pictographic and carved in stone and vertical columns, was later turned horizontally and stylized for wedge writing on sloth clay tablets to become the cuneiform writing used by the Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and other Near Eastern nations. The discovery of the Sumerian language and script, as well as knowledge that Sumerians and their culture were the cradle of Akkadian, Babylonian, and Assyrian achievements, prompted archaeologists to seek southern Mesopotamia. All of the evidence now pointed to the existence of the beginning. French archaeologists began the first substantial excavation of a Sumerian site in 1877, and the results of this single site were so comprehensive that others continued to dig there until 1933 without finishing the work. The site, known to the locals as Taloch Mound, was discovered to be an early Sumerian metropolis, the Lagash, whose conquest Sargon of Akkad had boasted about. It was really a royal city, and its kings bore the same title as Sargon, except it was written in Sumerian, Ansi, righteous ruler. Their dynasty lasted about 650 years, beginning around 2900 BCE. During this time, Lagash was ruled by 43 Ansis, all of whose names, lineages, and reign lengths were meticulously recorded. These Sumerian rulers could only assume the throne with the agreement of the gods, according to an Ensi named Ianatum, who left an inscription on a clay brick. 
He also reported the conquest of another city, demonstrating the presence of other Sumerian city-states around the start of the 3rd millennium BCE. And Temena, Ianadam's successor, wrote of erecting a temple and embellishing it with gold and silver, as well as creating gardens and extending brick-lined wells. He spoke of constructing a castle with watchtowers and mooring facilities. Gudea was one of Lagash's more well-known monarchs. He commissioned a significant number of statuettes, depicting himself in a votive attitude, praying to his gods. This was no ruse. Gudea had devoted himself to the worship of Ningrisu, his main deity, as well as the construction and reconstruction of temples. In his search for exquisite building materials, he acquired items from around the ancient world. Gudea imported precious metals such as gold from Africa and Anatolia, copper from the Zagros range, silver from the Taurus mountains. For temple and building materials, he sourced cedars from Lebanon, other rare woods from Ararat, diorite and carnelian from Egypt and Ethiopia, other materials from lands as yet to be identified by scholars. When Moses built a residence in the desert for the Lord God, he followed the Lord's explicit instructions to the letter. After the Lord had given him insight, King Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem. A person who had the appearance of bronze and held in his hand a flaxen string and measuring rod showed the prophet Ezekiel exceedingly precise designs for the second temple and a godly vision. Ur Namu, the ruler of Ur, described how his deity gave him a measuring rod and rolled string for the project after commanding him to build a temple for him and providing the necessary instructions. Even Judea made the same allegation 1,200 years before Moses. The instructions were delivered to him in a vision, which he documented in one continuous inscription. A man that shone like heaven by whose side stood a divine bird, commanded me to build his temple. This man, who from the crown on his head was obviously a god, was later identified as the god Ningirsu. With him was a goddess who held the tablet on her favorable star in the heaven. Our other hand held a holy stylus, with which she indicated to Gudea the favorable planet. Third man, also a god, held in his hands a tablet of precious stone. The plan of a temple it contained. Gudea is depicted seated with the tablet on his knees in one of his statues. Divine painting is clearly visible on the tablet. Gudea, as wise as he was, was perplexed by these architectural directions, so he sought at the help of the goddess who could decipher divine messages. She went through the significance of the instructions, the dimensions of the plan, and the size and shapes of the bricks that would be utilized with him. Judea then hired a male diviner, maker of decisions, and a female searcher of secrets to find the location where the god wanted his temple to be built on the city's outskirts. He then enlisted the help of over 200,000 workers for the construction project. Judea's perplexity is understandable as a simple looking floor plan was meant to provide him with all the knowledge he needed to construct a sophisticated ziggurat that rose in seven stages. A. Bellerbeck was able to comprehend at least some of the divine architectural instructions when writing in Der Alte Orient in 1900. Even on the partially damaged statue, the ancient artwork is accompanied at the top by groups of vertical lines whose number decreases as the distance between them increases. It appears the divine architects were able to provide complete directions for the construction of a seven-stage high-rise temple using just a single floor plan and seven different scales. While it has been said war stimulates man to scientific and material achievements, temple construction appears to have propelled the people and their rulers to higher technological achievements in ancient Sumer. The ability to carry out major construction work according to architectural plans, to organize and feed a large labor force, to flatten land and raise mounds, to mold bricks and transport stones, to bring rare metals and other materials from afar, to cast metal and shape utensils and ornaments, all speaks of high civilization, which was already in full bloom in the third millennium BCE. 
Even the most magnificent Sumerian temples were only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the magnitude and richness of the material achievements of the world's first great civilization. Sumerians should be attributed with the creation of printing, in addition to the invention and development of writing, without which a high civilization would not have been possible. Before Johann Gutenberg developed printing by employing movable type, Sumerian scribes employed ready-made type of various pictographic signs, which they used similarly to how we today use rubber stamps to impress the required sequence of signs in wet clay. They also devised the cylinder seal, which is the predecessor of our rotating presses. It was a little cylinder made of exceptionally hard stone to which the phrase or design had been etched in reverse. When the seal was rolled over wet clay, the imprint left a positive impression. The seal might also be used to verify the legitimacy of documents by making a new impression and comparing it to the old impression on the document. Many Sumerian and Mesopotamian holy records dealt with mundane duties like recording crops, measuring fields, and calculating prices, rather than holy or spiritual. Without a parallel advanced mathematical system, no high civilization would have been feasible. The Sumerian system, known as sexagesimal, created the foundation figure 60 by combining the mundane 10 with the celestial 6. This system is preferable to our current one in certain ways and is unquestionably superior to the subsequent Greek and Roman systems in others. It allowed Sumerians to divide numbers into fractions, multiply them by millions, as well as compute roots and elevate numbers to multiple powers. It's not only the first known mathematical system, but also gave us the concept of place numbers. Just as two might represent two or 20 or 200 in the decimal system, depending on the digits place, in Sumerian, two could signify two or 120, two times 60, and so on, depending on the place. The 360 degree circle, the foot and its 12 inches, the dozen as a unit are only a few instances of Sumerian mathematics that has survived into our times. Their simultaneous successes in astronomy, construction of a calendar, and other mathematical celestial triumphs will be examined in greater depth in subsequent videos. If you find this fascinating, please hit the like button. If you're not already, go ahead and subscribe. Click the bell so you'll be notified whenever we put out more great videos like this one. Sumerian and Mesopotamian life was based on clay, just as our own economic and social structure, our books, court and tax records, commercial contracts, marriage licenses, and so on, is based on paper. Temples, courts, and trading houses contained tablets of wet clay on which scribes might inscribe decisions, agreements, letters, or compute prices, wages, the area of a field, or the number of bricks needed in a construction. Clay is also an important raw material for making everyday items, as well as containers for storing and transporting commodities. It was also used to manufacture bricks, which enabled the construction of residences for common people, palaces for the rulers, and majestic temples for the gods. Reinforcing and baking are two technological advances credited to the Sumerians that allowed all clay objects to combine lightness with tensile strength. Reinforced concrete, an exceedingly powerful building material, can be made by pouring cement into molds holding iron rods, as was found by modern builders. But long before the Sumerians gave their bricks enormous strength by mixing wet clay with chopped reeds or straw. They also recognized that baking clay products in a kiln give them a tensile strength and durability. These technological advancements enabled the world's first high-rise buildings and archways, as well as long-lasting ceramic products. The advent of the kiln, a furnace that could reach high but controlled temperatures without including polluting items such as dust or ashes into the product, paved the way for an even larger technological leap, the age of metals. Around 6000 BCE, it's thought that man learned he could hammer soft stones, naturally occurring nuggets of gold, copper, and silver compounds into useful or pleasing shapes. 
The first hammer-metaled items were discovered in the Zagros and Taurus Mountain Highlands. In the Near East, the supply of local copper was quickly exhausted and the miner had to turn to ores, according to R.J. Forbes in the birthplace of Old World Metallurgy. This necessitated the knowledge and skill to locate and collect ores, crush them, and then smelt and purify them, procedures that could not have been possible without the use of kiln-type furnaces and other modern technologies. The capacity to mix copper with other metals was soon added to the art of metallurgy, culminating in bronze, a castable, hard but malleable metal. Our first metallurgical age, the Bronze Age, was also a Mesopotamian contribution to modern civilization. Metals trade accounted for a large portion of ancient commerce. It was also foundation for the formation of banking and the first monies, the silver shekel, weighted ingot in Mesopotamia. The numerous types of metals and alloys for which Sumerian Akkadian names have been discovered, as well as the rich technological terminology, attest to ancient Mesopotamia's high degree of metallurgy. For a long time, this perplexed historians because Sumer was bereft of metal ores, despite the fact that metallurgy began there. Energy is the answer. Without enough fuel to heat the kilns, crucibles and furnaces, smelting, refining and alloying, as well as casting, would be impossible. We know that many times ovens were set up in special areas where at the right time of year, fierce winds would blow through, allowing the kilns to reach temperatures not usually attainable. Mesopotamia may have been devoid of ores, but it was awash in fuels. As a result, the ores were transported to the fuels, which explains why many early inscriptions mention the transport of metal ore from afar. Bitumens and asphalts, petroleum compounds that naturally crept to the surface many parts of Mesopotamia were the fuels that propelled Sumer to technological supremacy. From the beginning to the end of the Roman era, R.J. Forbes, Bitumen and Petroleum in Antiquity, demonstrates that the ancient world's primary source of fuel was Mesopotamia's surface deposits. He concludes the technological usage of these petroleum compounds began in Sumer around 3500 BCE and that Sumerian knowledge of the fuels and their qualities was higher than that of later civilizations. The Sumerian usage of petroleum compounds was so widespread, not just as fuel, but also as a road building material, waterproofing, caulking, painting, cementing, and molding, that researchers discovered ancient Ur buried in a mound, nicknamed Mound of Bitumen, by nearby Arabs. According to Forbes, every genus and variation of bituminous compounds found in Mesopotamia had terms in Sumerian. Indeed, the name of bituminous and petroleum materials in various languages, Akkadian, Hebrew, Egypt, Coptic, Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit, can all be traced back to Sumerian origins. For example, the most frequent term for petroleum, naphtha, comes from napatu, flaring stones. Petroleum products were also essential to Sumerian advanced chemistry. We can measure Sumerian expertise by the diversity of paints and pigments employed, as well as procedures like glazing, as well as the astonishing artificial fabrication of semi-precious stones, including a substitute for the highly sought after lapis lazuli. Bitumens were also utilized in Sumerian medicine another sector with exceptionally high standards. Hundreds of Akkadian manuscripts have been discovered, many of which use Sumerian medical terms and phrases, indicating that all Mesopotamian medicine has a Sumerian basis. A medical section was incorporated in Ashurbanipal's library in Nineveh. There were three categories Sections of early legal codes dealt with fees payable to surgeons for successful surgeries, as well as penalties to be enforced in the event of failure. If a surgeon used a lancet to open a patient's temple and accidentally destroyed the patient's eye, he would lose his hand. 
some skeletons discovered in Mesopotamian burials had clear signs of brain surgery. A partially broken medical book describes the surgical removal of a shadow covering a man's eye, most likely a cataract. Another text references the use of a cutting instrument saying, if the sickness has reached the inner surface of the bone, you shall scrape and remove. In Sumerian times, sick people had the option of seeing an Azu, water physician, or an Iazu, oil physician. Lulu the doctor, according to a roughly 5,000-year-old tablet discovered in Ur, is a medical practitioner. Veterinarians were also present, referred to as doctors of oxen or doctors of asses. On a very early cylinder seal discovered at Lagash, that belonged to Ulagaldina, the doctor, a pair of surgical tongs is portrayed. The serpent on a tree, which is still a symbol of medicine, is also depicted on the seal. A midwife's equipment for cutting the umbilical cord is often commonly represented on cylinder seals. Diagnoses and prescriptions are discussed in Sumerian medical books. They prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Sumerian physician did not use magic or sorcery. Cleaning and washing were suggested, as well as soaking in hot water and mineral solvent baths, using vegetable derivatives, and rubbing with petroleum compounds. Plant and mineral-based medicines were combined with liquids or solvents appropriate for the application procedure. The powders were blended into wine, beer, or honey if taken by mouth. They were mixed with plant or vegetable oils if poured via the rectum or administered as an enema. Alcohol, which is used in surgical disinfection and as a foundation for many treatments, came to us through the Arabic word kol, which is derived from the Akkadian kuhulu. Medicine was taught in medical colleges using clay models of human organs. Temple rites required complex dissections of sacrificial animals, only a step removed from equivalent understanding of human anatomy. For the Sumerians, anatomy must have been a sophisticated science. Several cylinder seals and clay tablets represent humans laying on a surgical table surrounded by teams of gods or people. The Sumerians and their predecessors in Mesopotamia were preoccupied with matters of life, sickness, and death, according to epics and other heroic works. Gilgamesh, a king of Erech, was on the lookout for the tree of life or a mineral or stone that might grant endless youth. There were additional mentions of attempts to resuscitate the dead, particularly if they were gods. Upon the corpse hung from the pole, they directed the pulse and the radiance, sixty times the water of life, sixty times the food of life they sprinkled upon it, and Inanna arose. A scene of medical treatment illustrated on a cylinder seal dating from the dawn of Sumerian civilization strongly suggests that radioactive materials were understood and employed to treat specific disorders. It clearly depicts a man resting on a special bed, his face hidden behind a mask, and he is being exposed to some form of radiation. Were there any ultra-modern methods known and used in such revival attempts about which we can only speculate? If you have friends interested in historical mysteries, share this video with them. It really helps us out a lot. The establishment of textile and apparel industries was one of Sumer's first material triumphs. The advent of spinning and weaving machines in England in the 1760s is regarded as the start of our own industrial revolution. Since then, the majority of emerging countries aim to create a textile industry as a first step towards industrialization. This has been the case not only since the 17th century, but since man's first significant civilization, according to the evidence. Before the introduction of agriculture, providing flax, 
and the domestication of animals, which provided him with wool, man could not have manufactured woven fabrics. The scholarly consensus is that textile weaving first appeared in Mesopotamia approximately 3800 BCE. Sumer was also known for its clothing in ancient times, in addition to its woven fabrics. During the storming of Jericho, according to Joshua 7.21, a certain person couldn't resist the urge to keep one good coat of Shinar, which he had found in the city, despite the fact that the penalty was death. The clothes of Shinar, or Sumer, were so valuable that individuals were willing to risk their lives to receive them. In Sumerian antiquity, there was a rich vocabulary for describing both clothing and its manufacturers. Tug was the name of the basic garment, which was without doubt the forerunner, both style and the name of the Roman toga. Such garments were tug tushe, which in Sumerian meant garment which is worn wrapped round. Ancient pictures indicate not only a staggering amount of diversity and wealth in terms of clothing, but also elegance with good judgment and coordination among garments, hairdo, headdresses, and jewelry. Agriculture was another significant Sumerian achievement. Rivers were employed to irrigate year-round crops through a massive system of irrigation canals in an area with only seasonal rains. Even though Mesopotamia, or the land between the rivers, was a veritable food basket, the Latin name Armeniaca is a loan word from the Akkadian Armanu. The Spanish word Damasco, Damascus tree, refers to the apricot tree. The Kerasos comes from the Akkadian Karshu. All evidence points to Mesopotamia as the source of these and other fruits and vegetables in Europe. Saffron is derived from the Akkadian Azupirnu, crocus derived from Kurkanu through the Krokos in Greek. Cumin is derived from Kemanu, Hysop derived from Zupu, and Myrrh derived from Muru. The list goes on, and in many cases, Greece provided the physical and entomological link that allowed these land-based items to reach Europe. Sumerian cuisine consisted primarily of onions, lentils, beans, cucumbers, cabbage, and lettuce. The breadth and complexity of ancient Mesopotamian food preparation processes, as well as their cuisine, is equally amazing. Text and illustration support Sumerian knowledge of flour conversion, which they used to make a range of leavened and unleavened breads, porridges, pastries, cakes, and biscuits. Beer was also made from barley, and technical guides for the process have been discovered among the books. Grapes and date palms were used to make wine. Sheep, goats, and cows provided milk, which was consumed cooked with and converted into yogurt, butter, cream, and cheeses. Fish was a staple of the diet, mutton plentiful, and pig meat, which the Sumerians raised in enormous herds, was regarded as great delicacy. It's possible that geese and ducks were saved for the gods' banquets. The gourmet cuisine of ancient Mesopotamia developed in temples and in the service of the gods, according to ancient writings. One text described the offering to the gods of loaves of barley bread, loaves of emmer bread, a paste of honey and cream, dates, pastry, beer, wine, milk, cedar sap, and cream. Roasted meat was offered with libations of prime beer, wine, and milk. A specific cut of bull was prepared according to a strict recipe calling for fine flour made to a dough and water, prime beer and wine, mixed with animal fats, aromatic ingredients made from hearts of plants, nuts, malt, and spices. Instructions for the D 
daily sacrifice the gods of the city of Uruk called for the serving of five different beverages with the meals and specified what the millers in the kitchen and the chef working at the kneading trough should do. As we come across poems that loud the glories of good dishes, our respect for Sumerian culinary art deepens. Indeed, what can one say while reading a millennia-old kakavin recipe? This bird has been cooked and consumed in the wine of drinking, the fragrant water and the oil of unction. Without efficient transportation infrastructure, a prosperous economy and society with such large material industries could not have formed. For watercraft movement of people, goods, and animals, the Sumerians employed their two large rivers and a constructed network of canals. The world's first boats are shown in some of the earliest depictions. Many early documents indicate Sumerians engaged in deep water seafaring, utilizing a variety of ships to travel to distant countries in quest of metals, rare woods and stones, and other things unavailable in Sumer. A section on shipping was discovered in the Akkadian Dictionary of Sumerian Language, which listed 105 Sumerian phrases for various ships based on their size, location, or purpose for cargo, passengers, or the exclusive use of certain gods. A total of 69 Sumerian phrases related to ship personnel and construction were also translated into Akkadian. Such sophisticated vessels and technical vocabulary could only have come from a long seafaring tradition. The wheel was initially employed for overland transportation in Sumer. Its creation and widespread use enabled a wide range of vehicles from carts to chariots and likely gave Sumer the distinction of being the first to use both ox power and horse power for movement. Professor Samuel Kramer, one of Time's famous Sumerologist, studied the literary legacy discovered beneath Sumer's mounds in 1956. Each of the 25 chapters from the Tablets of Sumer described a Sumerian first, including the first schools, the first bicameral congress, the first historian, the first pharmacopoeia, the first farmer's almanac, first cosmogony and cosmology, the first Job, the first Proverbs and Sayings, the first Literary Debates, the first Noah, the first Library Catalog, Man's First Heroic Age, his first Legal Codes and Social Reforms, his first Medicine, Agriculture, and the Quest for Global Peace and Harmony. As a direct result of the development and adoption of writing, the first schools were created in Sumer. By beginning of the third millennial BCE, archaeological evidence, such as actual school buildings and textual evidence, such as exercise tablets, suggest the existence of a formal system of education. In Sumer, there were literally hundreds of scribes, from low scribes to high scribes, royal scribes, temple scribes, and scribes who held high state authority. Some of them worked as instructors in the schools, and we can still read their essays about the schools, their purposes and goals, curriculum, and teaching methods. Not only language and writing, but also the science of the day, botany, zoology, geography, mathematics, and theology were taught at the schools. Older literary works were studied and duplicated while new ones were written. The Umiya, expert professor, oversaw the schools and the faculty always comprised a man in charge of drawing and a man in charge of Sumerian, as well as a man in charge of the whip. One school alumnus told how he had been beaten for missing school, for insufficient neatness, for loitering, for not being silent, for misbehaving, and even for not having neat handwriting on his clay tablets. The conflict between Eruk and the city-state of Kish is the subject of an epic poem about Eruk's history. The epic tale describes how Kish sent envoys to Eruk to offer a peaceful solution to their quarrel. However, 
Gilgamesh, ruler of Eric at the time, preferred to fight rather than compromise. The fact that he had put the topic to a vote in the Assembly of the Elders, a local senate, is fascinating. The Lord Gilgamesh, before his elders of the city, put the matter and seeks out decision. Let us not submit to the house of Kish. Let us smite it with weapons. The elders' assembly, on the other hand, was intended for negotiations. Unfazed, though, Gilgamesh took the issue to the assembly of the fighting men who voted in favor of war. The story's importance stems from the fact that it reveals that a Sumerian king had to address the matter of war and peace to the first bicameral congress almost 5,000 years ago. Kramer awarded the title of the first historian to Entemena, king of Lagash, who recorded his war with Uma on clay cylinders. The inscription of Entemena was straight prose, produced merely as a factual record of history, unlike other texts that were literary works or epic poems whose themes were historical events. Because Assyrian and Babylonian inscriptions were deciphered long before Sumerian records, it was long assumed that Babylonian monarch Hammurabi authored and decreed the first code of laws, about 1900 BCE. However, as Sumer's culture was revealed, it became evident that Sumer had the firsts in terms of the legal system, social concepts, and fair administration of justice. A Sumerian monarch of the city-state of Ishanuna, northeast of Babylon, enacted regulations that fixed maximum rates for commodities and rental of wagons and boats long before Hammurabi, ensuring that the impoverished were not persecuted. There were other rules governing crimes against person and property, as well as family matters and master-servant relationships. Lipit Ishtar, monarch of Isin, had enacted a law much earlier. The 38 rules on a partially intact tablet, copy of the original inscribed on the stone stele, deal with real estate, slaves and servants, marriage and inheritance, boat hire, oxen hire, and tax defaults. Lipidishtar said in the preface to his code that he was acting on the orders of the great gods who had commanded him to bring well-being to the Sumerians and the Akkadians as Hammurabi also stated. Lipidishtar was not, however, the first Sumerian law encoder. A copy of rules inscribed by Ur-Namu, monarch of Ur, approximately 2350 BCE, more than half a millennium before Hammurabi, have been discovered on fragments of clay tablets. The laws were enacted on the god Nanar's authority to stop and punish grabbers of citizens' oxen, sheep, and donkeys, so that the orphan will not fall prey to the wealthy, the widow not fall prey to the powerful, the man of one shekel not fall prey to the man of sixty shekels. Unamu also decreed honest and unchangeable weights and measurements. However, the Sumerian legal system and administration of justice date back considerably further. By 2600 BCE, the world had changed dramatically. So much have, must have happened in Sumer that N.C. Urukagina felt compelled to implement reforms. Scholars have described a long inscription by him as a priceless record of man's earliest social reform based on a feeling of liberty, equality, and fairness, a French revolution imposed by a ruler 4,400 years before July 1789. Urukagina's reform decree listed the evils of his period first, followed by the reforms. The main problems were supervisors improper use of their authority to take the best for themselves, abuse of official standing, and monopolistic groups extortion of high prices. Reform edict outlawed all of these, as well as a slew of others. For a good donkey or house, an official could no longer establish his own price. A simple citizen could no longer be compelled by a big man blind, destitute, widowed, and orphaned people's rights were reaffirmed. Nearly 5,000 years ago, a divorced woman was granted legal protection. How long had Sumerian civilization lasted for a fundamental overhaul to become necessary? Urukagina said that his god Ningrisu had asked him to 
returned the decrees of bygone days, implying that it had been a long time. The plain conclusion is that we need to go back to even older systems and regulations. The Sumerian laws were upheld by a judicial system that painstakingly recorded and archived sessions, judgments, and contracts. A court was normally made up of three or four judges, one of whom was a professional royal judge, and the others drawn from a panel of 36 men. Sumerians were concerned with justice, whereas Babylonians were concerned with making rules and regulations. They believed the gods created monarchs to provide justice in the realm. There are several parallels to be found here with the Old Testament conception of justice and morality. The Hebrews were ruled by judges even before they had kings. Rulers were assessed not on their conquest or money, but on how far they performed the righteous thing. The Jewish New Year is a 10-day period during which men's deeds are weighed and reviewed in order to decide their fate in the next year. After all, the first Hebrew patriarch, Abraham, came from the Sumerian city of Ur, city of ur -Nami, and his code. Thus, it's probably more than a coincidence that the Sumerians believed in a deity named Nashi, who annually judged mankind in the same fashion. Sumerian concern for justice, or lack thereof, is also expressed in the earliest story of Job. Kramer was able to read a good portion of a Sumerian poem by piecing together fragments of clay tablets at the Istanbul Museum of Antiquities, which, like the biblical book of Job, dealt with the complaint of a righteous man who, instead of being blessed by the gods, was made to suffer all manner of loss and disrespect. He shouted out in agony, my righteous speech has been transformed into a lie. The unidentified suffering petitions his God in the second portion, similar to some passages in the Hebrew Psalms. My God, you who are my Father, who begot me, and lift up my face beseeching you, how long will you neglect me and leave me unprotected, leave me without guidance? Then follows a happy ending. The righteous words, the pure words uttered by him, his God accepted. His God withdrew his hand from evil pronouncement. Preceding the biblical book of Ecclesiastes by some two millennium, Sumerian proverbs conveyed many of the same concepts and witticisms. If we are doomed to die, let us spend. If we shall live long, let us save. When a poor man dies, do not try to revive him. He who possesses much silver may be happy. He who possesses much barley may be happy. But who has nothing at all can sleep. It is not the heart which leads to enmity. It is the tongue which leads to enmity. Sumerian civilization material and spiritual achievements were complemented by a significant development in the performing arts. In March 1974, a group of researchers from the University of California, Berkeley, made headlines when they declared that they had cracked the code on the world's oldest song. They were able to decipher and play musical notes recorded on a cuneiform tablet discovered at Ugarit on the Mediterranean coast around 1800 BCE. We always knew there was music in the ancient Assyrio-Babylonian culture, the Berkeley researchers noted but we didn't realize it had the same heptonic diatonic scale that was characteristic of contemporary Western music and of Greek music from the first millennium BCE until this deciphering. It was formally assumed that Western music originated in Greece, but it has recently been proven that our music, like so much else of Western culture, originated in Mesopotamia. This isn't surprising, given that the Mesopotamians were known to seek international harmony and concord through musical tones, according to Greek philosopher Philo. Music and song, without a doubt, must be considered a Sumerian first. Professor Crocker could only play the ancient music by building a lyre, similar to those discovered in the Ur ruins. Musical key numbers and a coherent musical theory can be found in texts from the second millennia BCE. And Professor Kilmer herself wrote that many Sumerian hymnal texts had what appeared to be musical notations in the margins. She stated, 
the Sumerians and their successors had a rich musical life. It's no surprise then that seals and tablets represent a wide range of musical instruments as well as singers and dancers performing. Music and singing, like so many other Sumerian triumphs, began in the temples. However, after beginning in the service of the gods, these performance arts spread outside the temples. A common phrase about the fees charged by singers used a classic Sumerian play on words. A singer whose voice is not lovely is a poor singer indeed. Many Sumerian love songs have been discovered, and they were almost certainly sung to music. The most moving is a lullaby written by a mother and sung to her sick child. Come sleep, come sleep, come to my son. Hurry, sleep, to my son. Put to sleep his restless eyes. You are in pain, my son. I am troubled, I am struck dumb. I gaze up to the stars. The new moon shines down on your face. Your shadow will shed tears for you. Lie, lie in your sleep, my son. May the goddess of growth be your ally. May you have an eloquent guardian in heaven. May you achieve a reign of happy days. May a wife be your support. May a son be your future lot. Not only is the conclusion that Sumer was the root of Western music and structure and harmonic arrangement the noteworthy thing about such music and songs, the fact that the music and poems do not seem foreign or alien at all, so we listen to them or read them, even in their depth of feeling and sentiment, is also remarkable. Indeed, when we consider the magnificent Sumerian civilization, we discover that not only our, our morals and sense of justice our laws, architecture, arts, and technology founded in Sumer, but that all Sumerian institutions are so familiar and so close to us. We're all Sumerian at heart, it appears. The archaeologist Spade unearthed Nippur, a once religious center of Sumer and Akkad, after excavating at Lagash. Many of the 30,000 writings discovered there have never been studied. Schoolhouses going back to the 3rd millennium BCE were discovered at Shorupak. Scholars discovered gorgeous vases, jewelry, swords, chariots, gold, silver, copper, and bronze helmets, the remains of weaving factory, court documents, and a colossal ziggurat whose ruins still dominate the landscape at Ur. Archaeologists discovered pre-Sargonic temples and artistic statues at Enshununa and Adab. Inscriptions about early empires were created by Uma. Monumental buildings and a ziggurat dating back at least to 3000 BCE were discovered at Kish. Archaeologists discovered Uruk or Erech in the 4th millennium BCE. They discovered evidence of the first use of a potter's wheel as well as the first colorful pottery baked in a kiln. The earliest stone structures discovered to date is a limestone block pavement. The earliest ziggurat, a gigantic man-made mound atop of which rose a white temple and a crimson temple, was first discovered at Uruk by archaeologists. The first inscribed text as well as the first cylinder seals were discovered. The excellence of the seals upon their first appearance in Uruk period is astounding, Jack Finnegan observed about the latter. The advent of the Metal Age can also be seen at other Uruk era sites. H. R. Hall discovered ancient ruins in the town of El Ubayad in 1919. The place gave its name to the first era of Sumerian civilization, according to academics. Sumerian cities from the time period may be found all over Mesopotamia. Clay bricks, plastered walls, mosaic decorations, cemeteries with brick-lined graves, painted and decorated ceramic ware with geometric designs, copper mirrors, imported turquoise beads, paint for eyelids, copper-headed tomahawks, cloth, houses, and above all, monumental temple buildings, were all produced in the southern Zagros foothills. Further south, archaeologists discovered Eridu, the first Sumerian city according to ancient writings. As the excavations went deeper, they discovered a temple devoted to Enki, Sumer's god of knowledge, that had been renovated numerous times. 
The layers clearly brought the researchers back to Sumerian civilization beginnings, 2500 BCE, 2800 BCE, 3000 BCE, and 3500 BCE. The spades then came across the foundation of the original Enki temple. It was virgin dirt beneath that. Nothing had been built before it. It was around 3800 BCE at the time. That was the start of civilization. It was not merely the world's first civilization in traditional sense. It was a vast society, all-encompassing and far more advanced than the ancient societies that came after it in many aspects. It was, without a doubt, civilization that gave rise to our own. Man attained this remarkable civilization in Sumer, approximately 3800 BCE, after beginning to use stones as tools some two million years earlier. The confusing fact is that scholars have no idea who the Sumerians were, where they came from, how or why their civilization arose. This was described as astonishing and outstanding, a flame that sprang up so abruptly. Ancient Mesopotamian scholar Leo Oppenheim emphasized the remarkably brief era in which the civilization rose, because it had appeared so suddenly, unexpectedly, and seemingly out of nowhere. Joseph Campbell wrote, With stunning abruptness there appears in this little Sumerian mud garden a whole cultural syndrome that has since constituted the germinal unit of all high civilizations of the world. Thank you.